morning, Blue Dot. I can't believe you're awake. Has everyone had some sleep? Because if you haven't, the next hour or so is probably OK. So do feel free to lie down at the back and just, just let it wash over you. This is, um, I'm afraid, not going to be a very good talk. Um, and it's not going to be a very good talk for, for a couple of reasons. One is that I haven't had much sleep, so sorry about that. Um, but the second reason is that what I want to talk to you about is science that's changing so quickly that I don't think we know yet what the implications are. I want to talk to you about how the discoveries we're making uh, of planets around other stars are telling us uh, about the history of our own solar system and about how things proceed throughout the galaxy. And that's not a story we normally tell. There's a sort of standard story of the discovery of exoplanets that people go through that I, I could do, and I could probably make it last 45 minutes, but let me try and give you the quick version. When you look at a scene like this, beautiful night sky, you see stars, you see gas. If you know a little bit more, you know that some of those dark areas there are places where dust is blocking out uh, the distant stars. And we know that those gas and dust clouds can produce stars, and they can produce planets. And we now know that when you look at the night sky, almost every star that you can see most likely has planets. And I think that's a profound and surprising revelation. I think people forget that that's amazing. If you're a physicist, maybe it's not too shocking. The physics that produced the planets in our solar system uh, will have operated everywhere. But until a few years ago, I couldn't tell you that most stars have planets, and we now know that. It changes how we look at the night sky. Uh, I can even show you some of the planets. This is one of my favorite uh, recent observations. This is a, a, a not very good picture of a star called HR8799. Um, what we've done is taken out most of the light from the star. Uh, so the yellow thing in the middle there has been added back in. That's not what it looks like. Um, but watch this. If we watch this star and we hide the light from the star itself over a couple of years, you see these four dots orbiting around that star. And those are four planets in this system, which range in mass between a couple of times bigger than Neptune up to a couple of times bigger than Jupiter. But I think this is one of the most profound observations we could possibly make. You've seen this animation before. Uh, recent, uh, even the recent BBC show by a certain particle physicist, who I'm not going to name, um, had a version of this for our solar system. We've watched it a million times, but this is real. This is data. These are images from telescopes, not an animation. And we can watch the joy of, of orbital mechanics happen in front of us. And so, yes, I really think that seeing these planets and knowing that these planets exist around almost every star uh, should change how we think about the universe. And we keep making new discoveries. Um, completely randomly, this week, we announced the discovery of a planet around the double star DS Tuck, uh, a planet around a star in Candace Van Ecclesey, um, HAP 790898 ABB, which is a brilliant name for a planet. Can you imagine if there are aliens that come from HAP 790898 ABB? They'd be delighted with their name. That's a double star. Um, Kepler-411d was announced, and E, the third and fourth planets in that system. Uh, Ogle 205-BLG-16670-LB, and Ogle 208 2018BLG 0569LB. And I don't need you to know anything about any of those planets. All of them announced in the last week. I just want you to know that it's now so routine that we can discover planets that I've made one of those up. And you don't know which one it is. Some discoveries are more significant. I was really delighted uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, when there were two planets announced around a star called Tea Garden Star, which is a better name. But Tea Garden Star has a name because it's a dim red dwarf, but it's one of the closest stars to us. It's only 12 light years away, and it has two Earth-sized planets. And what's brilliant is that they are planet B and planet C on here. They're close enough to their star that even though the star is puny, it's only about a tenth of the brightness of the sun, uh, these planets huddle around it, and they would have, 
if they were Earth-like, the kind of temperatures that we're used to here in Manchester. So slightly too cold for life, but otherwise all right. Um, sorry, northern people. Um, so these are two planets in what's called the Goldilocks zone, or the habitable zone around the planet. And there's a nice twist. The way the geometry works out, if these people on these planets were looking back towards the solar system, you'd see this view in the top left up here. So they happen to be in line with our solar system. And so they'd see our planets orbiting and passing in front of our star. So if there were astronomers on these planets, they've probably discovered us which is quite cool and interesting. So there's a standard story where we found planet after planet after planet, and that leads us to imagine a cosmos that we can explore. We can go in some sort of space Tesla out into the galaxy. We can make tourist posters. This is a NASA poster advertising a holiday on TRAPPIST-1E, uh, a planetary system discovered by Belgians and named after a beer. Uh, but TRAPPIST-1E has seven planets, three of which may be habitable, and they're crammed close together, so the view in this case from 1E, would be spectacular. You'd have these enormous planets hanging in the night sky, two of them as large to the eye as the moon is to us. And of course, once you start thinking about planets and travel, we can start thinking about aliens, and we can start talking about uh, intelligent civilizations, because surely, the standard talk goes, if there are hundreds of billions of planets in the Milky Way, one of a hundred billion galaxies in the universe, then surely alien life must be profound and common. You can also turn the story around. Once we start thinking about space as a place filled with worlds, not just an abstract realm of stars and gas and dust, but a place with planets that you could go on holiday on, you start to think about our own planet differently. And this weekend, people have talked a lot about the effect of seeing Earth from the moon. Uh, this is actually the first such image. This was taken by the Lunar Orbiter probe in 1966, uh, a couple of years before Apollo 8 took this image. And throughout our history of exploring, uh, astronomers and planetary scientists have continued to look back at Earth. Here's a shot of Saturn. This is from the night side of Saturn, taken from the Cassini uh, probe. But the really exciting thing about this image is this dot here, uh, which is indeed a blue dot. There it is highlighted. Um, and this is the Earth. And I like this picture because the Cassini team tried to publicize the fact they were going to take this image, and they tried to get everyone to wave at the same time. So I stood in the back garden, waved at Saturn. Actually, Saturn wasn't up at the time, so I had to wave at the floor. But symbolically, I was looking at Cassini as this image was taken. So I think that's really, really lovely. And of course, we can go further, we can start to think about Earth in the cosmic context, not just hanging in the background. This is one of my favorite images. Uh, this is a picture of sunset. It's not a brilliant picture of sunset. You can see a horizon and a sky and a bright star up here, which shows up really well on this projector. And if I zoom in on that star, you see it's a double star hanging in the night sky. And actually, this is the Earth and Moon as seen from Mars. So this is an image taken by a Mars rover looking at Earth as the evening star on the red planet, uh, and we've got the Earth and the Moon hanging there. And that's kind of beautiful, and it's profound, and it's interesting that we can put our world into the context of all of these planets that we're finding. That image, by the way, was taken by this thing. This is uh, an image from a, a spacecraft called Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which looked down on the Martian surface. And the interesting thing in this image is just here, um, that's the Opportunity rover. So that's the spacecraft that we sent to Mars to explore, imaged by another robot that's in orbit around Mars. Uh, and, and there it is. We can watch ourselves explore the cosmos. Now, I'm talking a bit about spirit and opportunity, the two Martian geologists whose uh, mission recently ended, robotic Martian geologists, because of this guy. This is Steve Squires. Uh, he's a planetary scientist. He, was, uh, he worked with Carl Sagan. Uh, but he's the principal investigator for these marvelous missions. And he was one of the first people that I interviewed when I started working on the sky at night. And he said something in an interview that changed how I think about this stuff. 
uh, forever and actually ruined the talk that I wanted to give to you. Because I wanted to stretch that 10-minute story about us understanding that the Earth's a planet to 45 minutes and to start talking about the fact that we find Earth-like planets and places that we can visit and places where alien life like us could exist. But I was talking to Steve just after his two little robots had landed on Mars. They were there primarily to search for evidence that Mars was once a wet world. It's now the driest of deserts, apart from some water at the polar caps. But Steve built these two robots to go and see whether Mars used to have water on its surface. The mission succeeded spectacularly. We now know that Mars was indeed a world of oceans and lakes, and for perhaps as long as the first billion years of its existence, it would have looked much more like Earth than the red desert that we see today. But at the time I was talking to him, they discovered minerals in the soil, in the Martian soil, that told them that that part of Mars was indeed once wet, but that the water would be highly acidic. In fact, it would have been more acidic than the sulfuric acid that you might have played with in a school chemistry lab. And so Steve was telling me about this, about this idea which was briefly in vogue of an acidic Mars. And I just said that that was disappointing, that it didn't sound very friendly, that it didn't seem like a nice place. It was very unearth-like. Now, Steve's missions were supposed to last 90 days, and they actually ran for much more than a decade. So the man was tired at this point, and he nearly, he's a really nice bloke, and he nearly bit my head off. And he said, look, I don't care whether we found evidence of Earth-like water. If you want a planet like Earth, you should look around you. We go to Mars because it's like Mars, because it's different from Earth, because it offers us a different experiment. We can learn things by going to Mars and finding that it's weird that we can't learn by staying here on Earth. And so, if you're a scientist, you should want Mars and the rest of the planets that we find to be as unusual and as weird as possible. And I think there's something really, really smart about that comment that we forget. Because it's very easy when I explain what we as astronomers do to everyone I meet, whether they want to hear or not, frankly. Uh, it's very easy to reach for that, oh, we're looking for other Earths out there. NASA's program, and to some extent the ESA one too, uh, is focused on finding Earth-like worlds out in the cosmos. But actually, the interest isn't there. The interest is in the weird and wonderful places that we found. So let me tell you about some of them, and let me tell you about what they're telling us. The good news is that <coughs> most of the planets that we found are weird. Um, this is, I think, the first graph of the day. So can we have applause for graphs, please? Thank you. I mean, normally that's a stretch at a music festival, but this is Blue Dot and Kraftwerk got there first last night, so I figured you'd be on board. Um, so each dot here is a planet. This is actually the planets found by NASA's Kepler Space Telescope. And this is the period, the time taken for the planet to go round its star, so the length of the year. And this is the size from sort of Earth-like to Neptune-sized to Jupiter-sized. And each dot is a planet, but these four big dots are Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. And we haven't found many planets down here. So our planets look special in this space. So it's possible that every planet we found, that it's true that every planet we found is weird. Now that's not hugely scientifically interesting because it's easier to find, for reasons I can get into later if you ask a question, it's easier to find big planets, they stand out, and it's easier to find planets that whip around their star very close. So we hope that one day we'll fill in this patch and we'll find actually Earth-like planets. Um, let's just skip, sorry, I'm already behind. Um, but we can sort of divide this diagram up into a more interesting space. Ignore Earth, we're looking at weird worlds, and here's what our modern taxonomy of um, planets looks like. So we're down here, we are a weird planet in the frontier, but at the top you've got the big gaseous planets, the Jupiters. In the middle, we've got what we've come to call ice giants, things about the size of Uranus and Neptune, um, and, and maybe some large worlds that are covered just with, with water. And then you've got rocky planets down here, 
And my favorite in here, we now have a category of planet called a lava world. And these were completely unexpected, and they're really very strange indeed. Here's a pointless artist's impression of one of them. Uh, this is... The trouble with exoplanets is that I have to show you something. Uh, so this is what Corot 7b doesn't look like, I suspect. But, but, but it, it is true in the sense that this is a planet that orbits a sun-like star. It's a bit bigger than the Earth. It's about uh, 1.8 times the size of the Earth. It weighs quite a lot. It's about five times the mass of the Earth. Um, and those numbers mean that it's almost certainly a rocky planet. But it's only a one and a half million miles from its star. And it goes round once every 20 hours. So its year is shorter than our day. And so what that means is two things. One is that it will probably be tidally locked. So just as the moon keeps the same face to the Earth as it orbits, this planet will keep the same face to its star as it orbits. And that means that the temperature on that side of the planet will be about 5,000 degrees, which means it will be molten. So this is literally a world made of lava. We didn't know these things existed. It shouldn't be there. We can't form a planet there, and we don't know uh, how they got there. We know of about seven or eight of these planets. One hypothesis is, is completely bonkers, but I rather like it. Here's a pointless artist's impression of a, um, a love blue dot. Everyone else wonders why I'm having a go at artist's impression. You lot just laugh. It's wonderful. This is HD 209458b. Uh, this is a much bigger planet, and it's a little bit further out. It's four million miles from another sun-like star. Um, and this is bigger than Jupiter. It's more massive than Jupiter, but it's also bigger than Jupiter because it's so hot that its atmosphere is puffed up. And I think you could make a case that this is the largest comet that we know about because its atmosphere is boiling away. It's so hot that it's followed by this tail of hydrogen which we've managed to detect. And we think that in about a billion years' time, this Jupiter-sized planet will have evaporated completely. And if at the heart of Jupiter-sized planets there's a small rocky core, something we think is possible, well, then you might be left with a lava world. So one way to make lava worlds is to take Jupiter, don't try this at home, uh, but you could take Jupiter, move it very close to the sun, wait a billion years so the atmosphere evaporates, and you're left with a nice lava planet uh, to show your friends and delight your family. Now, the hard bit of that, of course, well, there's several hard bits, but the really hard bit is moving Jupiter, right? This is true. Uh, I think we can demonstrate that. Um, but one thing that this population of planets has taught us is that planets move. They move particularly when they're young, but possibly later in life too. And the planets that taught us this are up here in the top left of this diagram. So remember, that's big planets that are very close to their parent star a class like the one I just showed you, which we call hot Jupiters. Now, they're not supposed to exist either. This is my favorite NASA illustration of the solar system. Here are our planets, ranging from the Sun. We've got Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. And there's a nice... I always get distracted with this because I really want to know where the thing that's lighting these planets is, is, is if it's not the Sun. But it's an official NASA graphic, so it must be right. Don't applaud it, you'll encourage them. Right, um, Mercury, Venus, so there's a pattern here, right? For 400 years, we thought we understood this. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, rocky, small planets. Great. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, big, gaseous planets of various types. So, we're astronomers, we can make a rule from one set of observations. Rocky planets... <laughs> Was there a theorist in the house? Somebody just laughed at that. It was somewhere around here. I'm watching. Oh, he's, he's, being, he's being shocked by his friend there. Yeah, all right, we'll talk later. Thank you. Um, if I was a real astronomer, these would be type 1 planets and these would be type 2 planets. But that, that, that's another story. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, rocky. Rocky planets form close to their star. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, gaseous. Gaseous planets form further out. Brilliant, we can explain that. We know where planets form. They form where stars form. This is a gratuitously beautiful shot of the Orion Nebula, our nearest stellar nursery. Here is a wonderful animation of the 3D information that we have about Orion. You can see the trapezium there, those four bright stars in the center. And as we zoom in, 
you can see there are little dusty, comety clouds called propolites, and they are newly formed stars surrounded with dust and gas from which you can then go on to form planets. So we've seen this process happening in the Orion Nebula. We can see dust disks around some nearby stars. Here is the Eye of Sauron uh, in the form of the Fomalhaut system. So this is Fomalhaut's a very bright star. It's the brightest star in the southern sky, I think. Um, and again, we've taken out the light from the star, and what you can see here is a disk of dust around this star. And embedded in the dust, there's this Fomalhaut B planet, which we can see moving. So here's the 2004 image. Here's the 2006 image. And so you end up with a, a disk of dust. And by dust, you should think sand grains. Carbon, silicon, they're actually a, a dust grain in astronomy is about a tenth of the size of a sand grain. And they often have ice on the outside. And what that means is when two of these dust grains in a disk like this collide, they can stick together. And then you can build up bigger and bigger things. So here is an experiment. Um, this is a bowl of water, which is going to simulate the disk. We shall agitate the water, because the disk is rotating. And then we're going to introduce some dust. This is very high tech, this kind of experimentation. Uh, and we're sprinkling in some pepper to act as dust. So I don't know if you can see that, but the clumps of pepper become visible over time, because they start sticking together because of the random motion of the dust within the disk. And if you left that a few billion years or so, a few million years or so, you can build up bigger and bigger things until you get to things that are about the size of this tent. And then we don't really know what happens, because if I collide two rocks the size of this tent together, I don't get a bigger rock, I get a rubble pile. But somehow we get over this gap, I'll talk more about how that might happen later, uh, we get over that gap and you start to, to build up bigger and bigger things that can then accrete gas from their surroundings. And so using that sort of idea, we can explain the pattern we saw in the awful NASA graphic, right? This process happens throughout the disk. Close to the star, it's hot, right? Astronomy is a simple science. Close to a star, it is hot. We've got a reputation for being intelligent, but it's really just making really obvious statements about things that are far away. Um, Close to the star, it's hot. There's n the gas, which is mostly hydrogen, boils away from the disk. And so you can build up bigger and bigger things using this dust accretion process, uh, sticking stuff together, if you like, and you end up with a rocky planet, and that's it. Further out, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, there's plenty of gas. And once you get to something that's maybe the size of Mars or, or Mercury, it very quickly grows an atmosphere. And so that makes sense. We expect rocky planets to form where it's hot and gaseous planets to form where it isn't. Which is fine, except that we've just found a whole bunch of Jupiter-sized planets that go around their star in just a few days. We've got to form a gaseous planet close to the star. Or we've got to form it way out in the cold bit of the disk and move it inwards. And it turns out that that's the solution. So the interesting thing is that once astronomers started spotting these hot Jupiters, theorists realized, using computer simulations and, and physics, that they should have predicted this, that if you form, if you have a disk of dust and you form a Jupiter-sized planet, there's friction with the remaining disk, and it will move inwards on a slow spiral. So Jupiters naturally move from where they form in towards the inner solar system. And for some reason that we don't understand, that didn't happen in our solar system. Our giant planets stayed put, leaving the inner planets uh, to remain small and rocky, and we don't understand why that happened. Uh, it's another example of how uh, what we're discovering in exoplanets um, affects our understanding of the solar system. We can think about this in more detail as well. Once you start thinking that planets might move, you have a much more complicated system to worry about. I think, certainly my mental model of a planetary system is still an old clockwork orrery. One of those beautiful things where you turn a handle and the planets go round. It's nice and stable and unchanging. And now I'm telling you that Jupiter, uh, or if you form a Jupiter-like planet, it might fling inwards towards the inner solar system. 
In fact, in our system, we know that Jupiter and Saturn interacted, Uranus and Neptune moved outwards, they may even have swapped places. We now have this idea of a chaotic and changing solar system. So what happens to the small rocky planets when Jupiter and Saturn come flying inwards? Um, well, I would have said nothing good, but I love this system. This is a, a pointless graphic uh, that illustrates Kepler-20, uh, which is another sun-like star, and there are five planets known in this system, all closer to the star than Mercury is to the sun. Um, they're called B, E, C, F, and D in some sort of obscene order. Uh, but Kepler-20b is the size of Uranus, 20 is the size of Mars, 20c is the size of Neptune, 20 f is about the size of Venus or Earth, and 20d is a little bit smaller than Neptune. So that's fine. All we have to do to make this system is that these two planets must have formed close to the star, and these three must have formed further out. So you've got to form three big planets out here, and then move them inwards without disturbing either of the two small planets. I don't know how to do that. I can move Jupiter if it's the only thing in the system, but I don't know how this system got assembled. But it does add, once again, to this sense that building planets is a chaotic and unstable uh, performance. We should have known that from our own solar system. We actually should have known that since somewhere around here. Um, we're talking a lot about Apollo this weekend. Uh, this is my favorite Apollo photo. This is from Apollo 16. And this is John Young, who decided to add a bit of dynamism to his shot with the flag. Um, I've also seen this as presented as clear evidence that he's on a soundstage, because how is he hovering, right? If you want to discuss that later, find Tim O'Brien, uh, and he'll be happy to help you. Um, but Apollo 16 was one of the, those crucial last few Apollo missions that had the moon buggy, which could explore further, and did some really spectacular science. Here's the Apollo 16 uh, landing site seen from above. Um, just out of interest, how many people knew we had photos like this that show the landing sites in detail? It's interesting that even in this crowd, it's a minority. So yeah, here is, this thing's the lander. You can see the tracks uh, that they left by driving all over the place to explore. And you can even see, this is a close-up, which is just about visible. This is a close-up. This, this black thing here is the shadow of the flag. So we know that, with one exception, all of the flags that were left by the Apollo astronauts are still standing. Uh, the exception is Apollo 11. Uh, where the flag toppled as the um, lunar ascent module kicked up dust. Buzz Aldrin saw it fall over and didn't say anything. Um, I don't know, maybe he was worried they'd make him go back and correct it or something. Um, but, you know, the, the bad news for American patriots is that the flags are probably bleached white, I think. Alice Gorman's here somewhere and can correct me if that's true, but people have argued that. Anyway, Apollo's real legacy apart from the inspiration, were the rocks that it brought back to Earth, uh, which are still being studied today. Lots of them have been kept in pristine condition so that modern uh, techniques can be used to, to unpick the history of the moon. And what they told us was that there was this weird period, uh, maybe a billion years after the solar system formed, called the late heavy bombardment, in which uh, a lot of the moon's craters were formed. So the moon, and by extension the Earth, were suddenly subject to a, a, a hail of large meteorites coming from the outer solar system. We also know that the moon formed by something hitting the Earth, something the size of Mars hit the Earth, and it's been argued that this must make our moon pretty unusual. Um, there's some minor evidence to support that. We've gone looking for moons around the planets uh, that I've been talking about, and we haven't found any yet. Well, there's one possible candidate, which is a weird system. Uh, here is an artist's impression of it. So this is Kepler 1625b, uh, which is a Jupiter-sized planet. This is not a picture of it. This is a picture of Jupiter. Um, and then this is, it may have a moon, which, which some people think they found, which is Kepler 1625b1, uh, which is how you label these things. And the best thing about this is that this is a Neptune-sized moon in orbit around a Jupiter-sized planet. There's enough space in the dynamic system that this thing could have a moon. And it turns out the moon of a moon is called a moon moon. That's the actual scientific term. And I have friends who have written a paper about the possibility that a moon of a moon might have a moon, which would be a moon moon moon. 
and they wrote the paper just so that they could get the term moon, moon, moon into a, into a scientific literature. Um, anyway, um, so, so people have argued because you need an impact of something the size of Mars with the Earth to form the moon, people have argued that it might be unusual. But we look around our solar system and we see unusual things all the time. Top left here is Mercury. Mercury is surprisingly heavy. It's almost like the core of a larger planet that was left after an impact. Venus in the top right here is a strange world. It's Earth-sized, but it rotates very, very slowly. In fact, its day is longer than its year, if you can imagine such a thing. One way to do that would be to strike it a glancing blow. And so all over the solar system, the inner solar system, we see evidence for collisions. And this is tying in with the idea that we've got from studying extrasolar planets that planet formation is a chaotic and unstable process. In fact, it's now believed, and I think everyone should know this, it's fascinating, it's now believed that there were something like 20 to 30 things the size of the moon, maybe half of them as big as Mars, knocking around the inner solar system for the first half a billion years or so of its history. So get rid of any, any animation, any particle physicist has shown you on telly of a nice stable solar system forming out of dust. This thing is chaotic and what we end up with is the product of chance. That's what looking at planets around other stars has taught us, that we're lucky to have ended up with the system that we've got. We can go further as we've discovered more planets and the 4,000th known planet entered the books a couple of months ago. We know that small planets are common, I've told you that. Uh, let's move on. But what's really interesting to a physicist is that <coughs> there's beginning to be a gap. So this is, these are all detections by Kepler. And we can see that small planets, which are everywhere, come in two sizes. They're either about two and a bit times bigger than the Earth. So you can think of those as like smaller versions of Neptune uh, or Uranus or they're about one and a half times the size of the Earth. And we call these super-Earths, and for some reason we don't call these puny Neptunes, but we probably should. But they're different things. There's this gap here that's real. And so if you're doing the planetary family tree, when you look at other solar systems, you have, we, we're used to dividing into giant planets and rocky planets, but we now know that we should be dividing into the mini Neptunes and super-Earths. They're different things. And these mini Neptunes may be the most common type of planet in the cosmos. And as far as we know, though there may be one lurking in the outer solar system, we don't have any of these in our solar system. So they count as weird worlds, and yet they're telling us something about planet formation. And what we think is happening is this. It's the process that I described earlier. You've got a cloud of dust, which assembles through this sticky process to form a core, which then starts to accrete gas. But at that point, the star turns on and starts to heat up our new planets. And what you've done at that point determines what kind of planet you get to be. If you've been slacking, if you're small and you haven't managed to use your gravity to grab much gas, when the star turns on, the gas will evaporate and you end up as a small, rocky world like the pathetic one we're stuck on. If you're a bigger planet and you've managed to accrete more gas, then you can hang on to it and you're destined to be a mini Neptune, not a super Earth. And so it's really exciting that you can distinguish these two things. We didn't know that that moment where the star turns on was a critical point in, e in, in evolution, um, but we do now. So I hope you're getting the point that finding as many different planets as possible makes an enormous difference to what we understand about our solar system. We've therefore tried to find as many different ways of finding planets as we can. The one I want to make sure I mention today, which I've talked about at Blue Dot before, is this. This is planethunters.org, where we ask the public to look at data from NASA's satellites, from Kepler, to try and find planets. We found some interesting things. We found about 100 new planets that the professional astronomers had missed. We found, this is a, a gratuitous artist's impression of Planet Hunters 2b, which is a Neptune-sized world around a sunlight star, seen here from the surface of a moon that we made up for the press release. And we didn't claim it existed. It's just a nicer picture than just having a planet floating in space. Um, I'm a big fan of Planet Hunters 1b, 
which was the only planet known in a four-star system. So you have to imagine a pair of stars in orbit around each other. That's reasonably common. Um, most stars may be in such pairings. But then there's another pair of stars, and the two pairs are close enough that they orbit their common center of mass. So it's a four-star system. And then going around two of the stars, not one, is a single planet. So this planet orbits a pair of stars on the outside. It's, what, it's what's called a circumbinary. And it's telling us something about planet formation. Uh, we know that because um, if you model the system, if you, if you have your four stars and you put a dust disk in there, then the dust disk falls apart faster than planets can form. The gravity of the stars does for it. But the planet's on a perfectly stable orbit, and it sits there taunting us because we don't understand where it came from. Um, Planet Hunters has, has moved on a lot. We've been running the project for nine years. If you want to uh, hear more about it, uh, you can obey the shameless uh, plug for my book, which is out in October. Um, or you can go to the new version of the site, run by my student, Nora Eisner, who's up there, uh, which uses data from NASA's TESS satellite. And TESS is going to be a world-changing mission. And previous NASA planet hunter, Kepler, was built before we knew that planets were common. So the team, who spent 20 years trying to persuade other people to do this uh, mission at all, planned for the fact that planets might be hard to find. And so they looked at an obscure patch of sky in the summer sky, which had no bright stars, because they needed to monitor as many stars as possible to increase their odds of finding anything. And so most of the planets that Kepler found, and there are thousands of them, orbit stars that are far enough away that we'll never really be able to follow up on those discoveries. We'll never be able to tell you anything about those planets. TESS has the opposite strategy. It was built knowing that planets are common, and it's looking at the bright stars in the sky. So if we ever travel to a planet around another star, the odds are it will be a planet discovered by TESS. And Planet Hunter's test takes the data from that satellite, which we get at the same time as the scientists who built it. We put it online. We put new data up on Friday. And so far, we've got 12 promising candidates of planets that have been missed by professional astronomers. We've got one that I think I, I was with this close to being able to tell you about it. Um, it's really exciting. Um, I'm not allowed to tell you because of NASA rules, and I'm frustrated. So let me tell you a different story. Let me tell you what discovery with TESS looks like. This is another graph. Can we have a round of applause for this graph, please? Thank you. This one's really exciting because this is the brightness of a star over time. Uh, and there's lots of noise, but this dip is the kind of dip you get when a planet goes in front of its star. And that's how we find that these planets are there. And what's really exciting is that this star is Tau Ceti, which is the nearest sun-like star and is featured in all sorts of science fiction. So finding a planet around Tau Ceti would be amazing. And some of our volunteers spotted this dip, and the system alerted us, and we started getting very, very excited that we had a planet around Tau Ceti. So you do the usual checks. You check that the data's OK. You see if you can model it. So here's what we think is happening. Here's a planet going in front of the star. And you can see you get this dip, which fits the data. This is a moving graph, which is even more exciting. Um, but, but we thought every, this all checked out, except that our planet around Tau Ceti, which was an Earth-sized planet around the nearest sun-like star, had an orbit which was almost exactly a multiple of the orbit of Tess around the Earth. So TESS, the spacecraft, is up in space looking for planets, but it's on this weird elliptical orbit. Uh, it's basically designed to hide from the moon, because the moon ruins your observations. I very, very nearly give a talk this weekend about how awful the moon is, because it halves the number of decent nights for astronomy. Uh, but I'm not going to do that. Um, but T TESS is my kind of satellite. It hides from the moon. And we thought, hang on, this is a bit suspicious that we're finding a planet, a dip in brightness associated on a timescale that matches the orbit. So we looked at the actual data, 
And this is a, one of the images. I'm going to show you raw data from a spacecraft, because that's how I rock at a music festival. Here's the raw data. This is an image of the Tau study field, completely uncleaned. So the stripes are just noise from the camera. Uh, but this thing is bad news. This is the reflection of something very bright, and our planet was right here. And so I can tell you, and this is an exclusive announcement, that we did detect an Earth-sized planet looking at Tau Ceti. We just discovered this one. <laughs> Independently. So, so I claim the discovery of the Earth. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, actually, my students did all the work, but I'll claim it anyway. Um, and it turns out even this wasn't an original idea. And, and, the, and, and just to remind us to think about the Earth when looking for exoplanets, um, I want to talk about a paper that was released. Here's the, the paper uh, by Rodrigo Lugo and Co. Uh, this was released on April the 1st, and it's the mapping of a terrestrial planet in the habitable zone. And what they did was they took the same software that we're going to use to create maps of extrasolar planets, and they used the background light from TESS over the course of its orbit, uh, and their knowledge of where TESS was, to produce a map of this planet. And here's the map they produced. <laughs> so the lines are added, right? But the bright and dark bits are real. That's from data. So they've used a spacecraft designed to look for extrasolar planets to detect oceans and continents on Earth. And my favorite thing about this paper is that they included an artist's impression of what this world might be like. So here's the artist's impression, which I think is just fabulous. I think it's pretty accurate. So why, what have I tried to tell you in this terrible talk? I've tried to tell you that planets are common, and that should change how you look at the sky. And I've tried to tell you that when you hear that something is Earth-like, you should be bored. You should be excited by the weird and the wonderful. Remember Steve's message about Mars. We look at these things because we want them to be different because then they have different stories to tell us. We're building right now in Oxford and elsewhere uh, a telescope called the Extremely Large Telescope, the European Extremely Large Telescope, which will be built in Chile. Here are some astronomers for scale. This thing is big enough. It's got a 39-meter mirror. It's big enough that the dome is, is constructed by a company that normally makes roofs for a uh, sports stadium. Uh, so that gives you a scale. This thing is being built partly so we can look at the atmospheres of planets. We can look at nearby stars that have planets, and we can look at their atmospheres. And one of the reasons you do that is that we want to be able to see if there are the signs of life in the atmosphere. Now, we have no idea whether how common life is in the universe. And so it's quite possible that after 20 years of effort building the thing and 10 years of effort observing the nearest 10 planets, we may not see the signs of life in the atmosphere of a nearby planet. But I want you all to remember this talk and remember that if those planets turn out to be weird and different, that is the most exciting thing of all. Thank you very much.